Uh, okay, there we go. Hello, everybody. Sorry about this. I'm after three years of COVID. I somehow there's always blips. <laughs> nice to see everybody. Okay, I, I apologize. Sorry, and everybody out there waiting. No problem at all. Uh, I guess we, we can start now. Yes. As, uh, yeah. Even though we have some of the attendees still joining, uh, mm. we can do it in the process, but that is uh, not a problem at all. Uh, and um, I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Georgian Institute of Politics. Um, my name is Renata Skarjute Kerestelidze. For those who don't know me, I'm a deputy director of the Institute. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to be able to uh, open today's panel uh, in cooperation uh, with the Caucasus Institute at uh, Jena University uh, on a topic that has been uh, in the minds and hearts of, of uh, many Georgians in the previous months uh, and now has uh, become a hot topic in Europe as well, hopefully. Uh, the Georgia's European perspective experiences from the Western Balkans and Eastern Europe. Uh, last year has been indeed uh, eventful uh, in terms of uh, Georgia's EU uh, relations with the European Union. Uh, it has become much less technical, much more political in nature uh, after years and years of um, discussing different pro programs and uh, 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 different, I don't know, uh, more technical aspects of it. Uh, now the issues of European idea, of geography, of the role of the EU in the region uh, has become much more prominent, much more relevant uh, and the debate will change uh, uh, will, will change for all of us in the upcoming months uh, and years. And I'm really happy that today we have an excellent panel to start this debate and discussion. Uh, we'd like to see uh, what are your thoughts about the Georgia's perspective, but also about the role of the European Union uh, in its neighborhood. And um, before we start, I'd like to also welcome and give wor word to our partner, uh, Dr. Diana Forker, uh, who is head of the Caucasus Institute at Siena University. Perhaps you'd like to say a few words. So hello and welcome everybody. I'm really happy that, that like this is the first time that our institute has this kind of official cooperation with the Georgian Institute of Politics. This is of course a, a huge honor also for us. So my name is Diana Forker and I'm professor for Caucasus studies at Jena University in Germany, which is uh, the only university in Germany actually that had the, has this type of uh, institute and this type of professorship. So we are also lucky that the university actually decided to uh, to uh, keep on going with this uh, Institute for Caucasus Studies. And I'm personally, I'm a linguist, so I'm not very much involved in politics, uh, but uh, Dr. Bedina Lebanitze, who is an assistant at our institute, he's a political scientist. And uh, together we uh, uh, wrote a successful application for a project that is concerned with the EU foreign policy in the South Caucasus, and it's dealing with the new concept of resilience that is used in this approach. And uh, within the project, um, we are organizing now this round table discussion. It's not the first one, it's the third one actually, uh, in uh, hopefully to be established uh, series that will continue afterwards. And yeah, I'm very luck, uh, happy that we found such a very interesting and nice panel that we put together and that actually also, so many participants are females because it's not that, uh, <laughs> it's not always the case. So, but of course, uh, um, yeah, this is nothing against, <laughs> to say, <laughs> our male participants. In any case, I am um, looking forward to a very interesting discussion. And I would say, so welcome to everybody and let's just start with the discussion. 
Thank you. And now we can give word uh, to our moderator of the, today's discussion, Judy Dempsey. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yes, who, um, who is a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe and editor-in-chief of Strategic Europe and will be leading today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Renate and Bettina for inviting me and all the guests and new people to see. I, I think this is very important, uh, this session, um, uh, for three main reasons, and I'll just list them and then I'll throw out the questions. One is we're getting into the serious uh, politics of transition. Transformation and transition of, of these societies are so complex. They swing back and forth. Um, reformers or authoritarian tendencies and they clash. We must never underestimate the difficulties of transformation. The second thing is I'm so pleased that Yena is taking on this because the studies of the Caucasus and of Eastern Europe and Russian Ukraine is declining in some countries, in Western Europe particularly. The Eastern European countries are really terrific on this. The Polish Center, Center of Studies, Tallinn, um, Czech Republic, Slovakia is picking up its shoes, Romania concentrates in this area. Western Europeans are getting lazy and the Germans particularly, and they really have to invest in this. And the third thing is, of course, Germany, which will be discussed. So that's enough for me. So uh, here's our panel. Um, we have uh, uh, Tanya. It's great to see you. Um, where are you? And I have to find you on my on my screen. I have to get a big screen there now. Uh, gallery. Gallery is much better. Tanya, it's very really nice to see you. Tanya and I go back a couple of years because we did a wonderful EU LISCO pro program, Limited Statehood, where I met uh, great colleagues from uh, across Eastern Europe. So, Tanya, what are we going to do about Georgia? That's it? Okay, great. So let's get right, let's cut through the chase and get right on it. Um, so let me first um, start by saying how pleased I am to be part of this roundtable. It's a great opportunity uh, also to see you, Bettina. Um, we've been um, interacting on Georgia and the Caucasus, more broadly speaking, for quite some time. Um, and of course, it's great to see and get to know all the others on the panel. I hope it's not the last time that we have the opportunity to discuss Georgia. Um, well, you've got five minutes. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I won't waste much more time for the panel. Okay. So just to say that I uh, I put a lot of effort in convincing German policymakers of the candidate status, uh, not only for Ukraine but also for Moldova and Georgia. And um, in fact, uh, you know, three weeks before um, uh, uh, Scholz, Macron, uh, Draghi, and Johannes uh, traveled to Kiev, you know, I Ooh. I would have never thought that uh, that that there was such a thing as a candidate status in the cards. And um, now, of course, um, we all thought either all three get it or none. In the end, it turned out that Georgia was singled out from the two countries. And I, as much as I can understand the disappointment, I think this is also an opportunity for Georgia, right? Um, because the, our research shows that the, the EU's impact on democratization processes are the strongest when there is credible conditionality. And I think by, on the one hand, acknowledging Georgia's membership perspective, and let's not forget that's a huge step forward given the agony the EU and the member states had with this, with this European perspective. So giving Georgia the membership perspective on the one hand, but not just the candidate status, right? And, um, and giving, plus giving the other two countries, Ukraine and Moldova, yes. that are part of the, of the trio countries, the, the candidate status already. I think that puts a lot of pressure on the Georgian government and gives the EU tremendous leverage to empower Georgian society to put pressure on the, on the Georgian government to finally enact the reforms they've been promising. There's been a lot of talk, but little walk. And um, from all we know about Eastern enlargement, um, this is sort of a moment in which, as I said, the EU has the greatest potential 
to empower pro-democratic, pro-EU forces. And let's not forget, 80% of Georgian population are in favor of EU membership. So I can understand that the Georgian people are very upset about the missed opportunity uh, of not being part of of uh, you know of, of not joining the other two countries of getting in getting a, a candidate status, but still there is a clear promise of the candidate status if Georgia fulfilled clearly defined criteria. So it's not a surprise. Mean, and, and let me just flag one thing: the reason why Georgia didn't get it and the others to did were not related to economic issues. Georgia is doing actually quite okay with regard to. Uh, economic issues. It's also not the so-called key criteria, right? It is the political criteria. It is because Georgia has been backsliding on issues of democracy and the rule of law over the past, well, you know, um, months, years, depends. Uh, um, but it's clear that Georgia, which used to be a leader in terms of, you know, democratic reforms, has turned into a legate. Um, of course, it's hard to compare um, Ukraine with Georgia, but um, it's clearly, I think, what explains the decision of the member states to keep Georgia out is the regression that uh, people have been seeing or at least perceiving in, in Georgia. Ge the media, when Georgia ever was discussed in the media, it was no longer as the front runner of reforms uh, um, in the Eastern Partnership. It's now you know, it's 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 a lecker. It's sliding back, and that inv evokes memories of Hungary, which used to be a front runner too, and turned into a leader in sort of in, in terms of backsliding. So I think the EU, the member states, do not want to repeat this and want to make sure that Georgia complies with the political criteria. And that is how I read the list of the, the 12 priorities the Commission has specified. And the good news is, not only has, to be, has the Commission been quite explicit about what it expects the Georgian government to do in order to get candidate status, there is also a monitoring process and a time horizon. I mean, the first evaluation will be taken at the end of this year, which is quite soon, and it will be ongoing. And with the election coming up in 2024, I think there is a huge opportunity for the EU, but most importantly for Georgian society to put pressure, not only on the government, but also on the opposition to finally initiate the reforms that are necessary for Georgia to receive the candidate status. And I stop here, Julie. Uh, sorry, super, Tanya, thank you for sticking to the time. Um, frankly, um, cancel. Um, just listening to you, I'm just looking at Toby here and um, Natalia as the, as the former Georgian envoy to the EU. I mean, it, 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 we have seen the EU's record in the Western Balkans, frankly. We've seen it in, in Bosnia, we've seen it in Kosovo, we have seen it in Serbia, we have seen it uh, in, in North Macedonia without the Americans. I, I, I think North Macedonia would, would still be in a limbo. Um, I think I, I would like to go straight to Toby on this, frankly. Um, promises, perspectives, uh, no candidate status. We saw what happened at the summit uh, two weeks ago. Um, Toby, I mean, are, is, is, is Georgia going to be uh, put into um, a, a limbo status or can the EU really change its mindset when dealing with, with uh, Georgia? Yeah, Judy, that's, a, that's an excellent question and thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, look, look, just, just looking at what we're discussing today, um, I, I think I'm afraid the uh, experience from the Western Balkans has been has been very 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 problematic, if I were to choose a, a very diplomatic word. Um, but at the same time, I mean, just just listening to what Tanya said about uh, credible conditionality, I, I also don't think it has to be that way. This is within the EU's uh, power to change. So I think there is homework to be done on the Georgian side in Ukraine in Moldova as well as here in Brussels and in the member states. Um, and I think this would be an excellent idea for that to happen, for, for, for that process to start 
uh, here in the EU institutions. Now, my issue is, uh, I, I just came out of a meeting with, uh, with a very senior person in the European Commission. Uh, I've talked to people in, in, in various departments over the last few days and weeks. I see absolutely no evidence. A everyone is telling me this time it will be different. We've learned and so on and so forth. I see no evidence of that. There hasn't been a policy review of the last you know, 20 years since the Thessaloniki summit made the promise of eventual membership to the Western Balkans, almost 20 years. Um, there has been no effort to say, well, what's gone wrong? Why are we still here 20 years later? Now by here, I don't mean to suggest that we're at the same stage that we were at in 2003, but uh, you know, of the Western Balkans six, we have two, that don't yet have a candidate status. We've, we've got two that have candidate status, but that seem to be unable to open membership negotiations. And we have two that are apparently stuck forever in, uh, in the limbo of, of actual ongoing uh, negotiations. So even, even if you clear the first hurdle to get candidate status, um, that, that does not really guarantee anything. Now, again, I think we need to take this as a moment of reflection. Uh, I think there's a, there's a number of ideas out there uh, from civil society in these countries, by these countries, I mean, both the Caucasus, Ukraine, but also the Western Balkans, as, as well as various you know, think tanks and so on uh, in, in, that are focused on the EU about what needs to change. And, and, and one thing that's obvious to everyone is, is that current EU member states are using the process to push through their bilateral agendas. Uh, we're seeing that right now in the case of Bulgaria and North Macedonia. We saw it earlier for 15 years uh, between Greece and North Macedonia. But, but I mean, the truth is that, you know, neighbors with a very complicated history will have reasons to block each other. Um, and there will always be something that somebody might come up with um, uh, to use uh, to block. Now, that at the end of the day, I actually think is a little bit of a sideshow. I, I don't mean to, 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 to uh, you know, minimize its, its importance, but I think the real big issue in the EU is of, an, of a different order of magnitude. And that is that France is actively opposed to enlargement and undermines it at every step of the way without saying so, of course. Um, Germany is kind of still interested, but I think in a very, um, it, it's not willing to take leadership. And no country really in the European Union believes in enlargement in a way that will prompt it to take meaningful leadership on membership negotiations as a tool for reform. Hungary, of course, wants all of these countries to come in as, as quickly as possible. Again, talking about the Balkans, because it wants to enlarge the club of you know, autocratic, autocrizing, uh, illiberal member states. But that's a different story. But, but we, we no longer have the leadership that we used to get from Germany, that frankly, we used to get from the United Kingdom. Um, and that is, that is a real serious problem because the EU institutions on their own, they will not, um, they will have to be forced by the member states to really do, uh, do a, a rethink of the yeah. whole situation. Thanks, Toby. This is actually very important. And it's actually quite a realistic but a pessimistic picture because frankly, Sorry the appetite that. for enlargement isn't there. Yes. And um, I mean, Germany is not even ambiguous, just doesn't give leadership anymore. France is doing the running. And don't forget, several countries hide behind France. Absolutely. Yes. And so I mean, it's always, always very well having a country to blame. But we know the Netherlands and some other countries hide behind it. And um, I would just throw out an idea here um, for the future that it would be very nice if, if the Central Europeans, uh, if Central Europeans played a much more prominent foreign policy role but they're not doing this. And um, I want to go to uh, Natalie Sabanadze. Natalie, I'm, I, we haven't met yet, but now we do. Um, it's very important that you're here. Um, I want you to pick up on, on some of uh, Toby's points. And we, and we have to be really candid on this. I mean, is the EU serious about enlargement? I don't think they're serious about uh, enlargement for Ukraine. 
or Moldova or Georgia. And if, I mean, I, what I'm trying to get at is, do we need a kind of completely different mindset on how we're going to integrate these countries into, into democracies, bearing in mind the whole Russia agenda? Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to meet you and everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Um, and I will pick up some of the issues that have been raised by the panelists, both very important. Um, I have to say I am worried about the situation, both given what is going on in Georgia and the kind of background uh, in the EU that Toby has described very well. At the same time, three months ago, uh, if somebody had told me that Georgia would get a European perspective, I would say that, you know, I mean, they're living on a different planet. It was absolutely unimaginable precisely for the reasons that have been out, outlined. So it, it took a real kind of geopolitical earthquake for the EU to be pushed into action in many ways, you know, by default than by design. And, and I kind of often draw parallels with the end of the Cold War. I mean, the EU was also at that point pushed onto the international scene again by default by the circumstances and had to come up with kind of responses to uh, to the need of Central and Eastern Europeans. So there are some similarities there. There's also similarity in the fact that, you know, when it comes to enlargement, EU has never really been united. There's been always at previous rounds of enlargement as well, a lot of disagreements between member states, a lot of skepticism uh, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, it's not new. However, uh, what is new is the, uh, uh, the magnitude and, and the speed of this decision. So the EU did not really prepare for it. It's not something that's been thought through. It's been done under geopolitical pressure and under moral pressure, to be honest, right? To be able to respond to Ukraine, to give them a positive signal, kind of a symbolic peace umbrella if you want to. And we, Moldova and Georgia, were there at the right moment, uh, luckily. Um, with the Balkans, and there's been a, a, a comparison there, again, honestly, and Toby was saying that Balkans got stuck partly because the candidate countries were slow on reforms, but also because there was really no wish to enlarge. And this limbo could have continued for a long time. So now we're joining this group. I mean, I want to emphasize, it's a big step. We were in the Eastern Partnership Group. Now we've been put in the candidate status countries group, so the Balkans. So it's a big jump for us, unimaginable three months ago. But being there is not necessarily easy and it's not gonna get us the membership also very easily. Now to look at the European perspective and uh, I, not in defense, but in kind of explanation of the situation, something that we don't do often in Georgia, we look at things from our perspective only, but not from, let's say, Brussels, right? So what would that mean for the EU? Imagine instead of 27, having 35, 36, very uneven uh, European Union, enlarged, right? The decision-making potentially paralyzing. So EU will have to reform. EU will have to start thinking not just about enlargement, but in parallel about its own internal reform. Yeah. Because if they're going to keep the consensus decision-making, for example, there will never be a decision. Um, EU has to think also how better do the transformation. Because before it was seen okay, we have this wonderful transformative power, there are more doubts about it, this, the circumstances are different. So trans, the approach to transformation, and Judy outlined about the complexities of it, and how the kind of context influences it, that also has to be kind of rethought so that EU doesn't get not only three more Hungaries, but I don't know, mm -hmm. five, six new Hungaries. And, um, also, for the global perspective, I mean, we, as outsiders at the moment, we need EU's positive uh, role in the global affairs, right? We need EU to be a strong political player. 
So we were happy, like myself now as an, as an expert or an academic, right, was happy to see EU move, uh, act uh, kind of geopolitically while it wanted to do, but never had managed. But, you know, this has to be done not at the detriment of EU's power. If it's enlarged and its power is diluted, and there is a big risk of that, that would not be good for anyone, neither for Georgia, nor for candidates, and nor for the, neither for the world. So all of these things need to be rethought together, and then maybe we can reach to some conclusions. But perhaps, Toby, even, I'm no longer in Brussels, so I don't know whether this thinking is happening. Mm -hmm. and if there is time, maybe we can go back to Macron's yeah. idea of this political community later. But, you know, that's kind of something that has been put forward, I suppose, as a, uh, as a solution to, to this. Your mic is off. First time I've ever used this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before uh, uh, questions are rolling in, before we take on the questions, and I think it's very important to involve as many people as possible, um, we have serious issues here, actually. And I think, um, um, Natalie, you bring this up, and this is one of Tanya's uh, big uh, interests as well, and, and Toby's as well. Um, it's something really fundamental. It's the direction of Europe, of the European Union. And, you know, can there be any kind of direction in terms of future enlargement if the European Union doesn't do a serious uh, change of the treaties? I mean, you, you, cannot, you cannot do this enlargement if you don't look at the treaties, if you don't look at how the voting is done, if you don't look at the public opinion. And... I, I can understand why, why von der Leyen, and hats off to her, actually. She's been really interesting in dealing with Moldova and Ukraine, but she did this for geostrategic reasons because of Russia, but she won't wear the same hat for the Western Balkans. I mean, it's a very different issue. But my question to all three of you before we open the floor is, does the EU know, do the institutions, leaders know where they are leading the EU towards? Uh, Tanya. Yeah, that's a great question. It, it relates to the relationship, uh, Natalie, I think uh, 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 most explicitly between deepening and widening, right? There is a debate to what there is, right extent there is a trade-off or one, uh, you know, presupposes the other. I, I fully concur that a widening, an enlargement without a substantial reform is not going to work. But honestly, the, the, the next enlargement of the EU is years away. We need reforms now, right? So yes, we do need reforms also because of upcoming enlargements, but there are a gazillion other reasons why we need reforms, right? <laughs> so I think we should not concern ourselves, we should not use enlargement as a justification for asking and thinking of reforms. Okay, that's my first point. My second point, which might be a bit more controversial, I do not believe that the solution to all our problems is getting rid of unanimity. I think we are kidding ourselves if we believe that by simply abolishing unanimity, you know, all the, all the problems of the EU will magically disappear. Just to give you one example uh, that illustrates my point, that was in, 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 in September 2015, when the EU, by qualified majority, decided on the mandatory mm. uh, reallocation of refugees, right? Mm, yeah. And Okay. okay, so so that didn't work. Member states will simply not comply with decisions taken by qualified or majority. So that's just one example. So we mm -hmm. need to think very carefully, Judy. So we, we yeah. have to think within the existing frame. Absolutely. Right? Okay, so. That's really interesting, Tanya. I, I, you can still hear me, yeah. Toby, I want to... I want to continue this and just slightly get out of the Western Balkans uh, matrix. And my question is really about um, the, the ambiguous ambitions of the EU. They say they want to be the global power and we have this strategic compass and this comprehensive strategy. I mean, we do this, that and the other. Our energy policy is, slightly, is all over the place. And then Germany gets the turbines from Canada and feeds Russia even more with Nord Stream 1. I, I, it's so... Anyway, the, the point I want to get at is, 
how can we even discuss enlargement when we have a situation in the European Union when there's a total uh, division and disarray among the member states about how to deal with even the most basic issues of digitization, of reform, uh, Tanya mentioned it, of enlargement, another one, of energy policy, of climate change, for God's sake. So uh, are we, should we get our own house in order before we leave the enlargement issue? Or should we actually um, be very careful that if we put off the perspective issue, we will have very unstable countries on our borders, which Russia and China will exploit. Well, I actually think, and, and this goes back to something Tanya said as well as Natalie, um, I, I, I do think this has been a pivotal, I mean, 24th of February has been a watershed moment for the European Union, uh, as, as well as for lots of other people, obviously. Um, uh, and I think we ought to use that because the response from the European Union, both as an institution and, and, and as a community of 27 member states, has been unusually swift, determined, deep, serious. Um, and, and so far, frankly, the consensus has largely held. I mean, yes, Hungary, you know, has been blackmailing um, the EU and there's been all sorts of caveats and exemptions and this and that. Uh, yes, absolutely. You're, I think, frankly, you're always going to get that with, with, mm -hmm. with club as big as the EU. I mean, look at the paralysis that we see in the UN. So, of, mm -hmm. of course, you can't expect that everyone is sort of 100% same line. But this has been mm -hmm. an extraordinary... Sh I, I would not have thought, actually. I thought the EU would splinter divide b before now. Um, and, and so that gives me some hope that we can drive this discussion forward. Now, I'm, I'm, it makes me nervous when we, talk, when we start talking as the EU about geopolitics, because mm. that is a recipe to look at these countries, especially, um, uh, you know, sort of marginal peripheral countries, geographically speaking, politically speaking, speaking in terms of the mental geography in, in Western Europeans' heads. You know, the, the, the real sort of federalists in Western Europe, they, they wouldn't be able to find Georgia on a map. As yeah. a they care about core Europe. They care. They can't find Slovenia on the map. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. True. Um, and and so, so talking about mm. pu putting our relationship with mm. the neighborhood entirely under the umbrella of geopolitics mm. is, of course, a recipe for embracing the Alexander Vucic's of this world who, who promise stability and deliver on their promises in the name of keeping Russia at bay. Um, and, and that would be a fundamental mistake because it would undersell the EU's, uh, not undersell, underutilize the EU's transformative power yeah. that, that it does have mm -hmm. uh, we should we should not be cynical mm -hmm. about that that power <laughs> exists it's mm -hmm. just not being activated properly thanks toby for this this a very important last point particularly and that brings me uh, absolutely to, to to natalie um given what's happening to your country now and uh it's as you know tom deval writes quite a lot about georgia for our strategic europe blog but is the EU the transformative power that it thinks it is and that we want it to be? Sorry. Um, well, there is no better one. Uh, let's start with that. Uh, so I do believe it is. I also believed even before the uh, perspective appeared that if we wanted to make most of it, even with the association agreement, it would have been possible. Now, of course, what uh, was already mentioned by Tanya, the, uh, this perspective gives greater leverage to the EU, hence greater power to, uh, to deliver on transformation. But this is a two-way street. Obviously, there should be an interest. And I had always thought that Georgia would have been a good case where the investment in transformation would have 
had higher returns because there was a local demand for it. So the things need to match. I mean, the, on the one hand, there should be a guidance, investment, experience, et cetera, that comes from the EU. But if there is a local public pressure on the government to deliver, these two would work well. And this is something that needs to be leveraged uh, skillfully uh, by the EU. Now, what is happening today is worrisome because I feel that the Georgian government, the way it positions itself, is trying to get out of it, is trying to kind of sway away from this leverage and reduce its impact. Uh, in, it's, it's paradoxical in many ways because uh, you know, this has been this particular power, uh, political party has been in power for a long time. It has gone through transformations in its current kind of um, composition, let's put it this way. Uh, it feel, I feel that this is their main priority. The main priority, what is happening to Georgia is in a way urbanization. Uh, what is happening in Georgia is that we have a concentration of power in the hands of one party. Uh, but there is a semblance or a facade of democracy which is maintained and they insist on maintaining it. So Georgia will never go as far as being uh, Belarus, so it will not be treated as such. So the facade will be there, but the meaning of it is eroded by the de democratically elected um, government. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's a kind of a hybrid region, like you have a hybrid war where it's very difficult to detect when it begins and when it ends and what exactly form it takes. Mm -hmm. There is similar thing that is happening. Yeah. So that's why, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're doing it quite well. I feel they're succeeding in many ways. Yeah. It's kind of like duping in, <laughs> to, to a degree the, the, the EU and the kind of discourse that we hear today mm -hmm. uh, explain what is happening by, uh, you know, you yeah. know what is going on. So yeah. I think that's something but, that you need to keep in mind. Yeah, but all the more reason, as all of you say, to the, for the EU to use uh, its leverage. The EU is actually quite bad at doing its leverage, but it's got also come from within. Just one point before we open it up. Um, I think there's a weakness of the EU and having covered this uh, for such a long time over the years, that they concentrate on on the on the elites and the status quo and there should be um uh, more from the bottom up and from the top down and that the 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 uh, just not ngo civil society grassroots the, the the bottom up should be should play a much greater role to create the pressure and this is what happened in moldova which surprised us all it, it, and it some ways happened in, in Romania, despite the huge corruption there. But it's just so important not to focus and it's on, on the elites, on the status quo and the establishment. You know, it's easy for EU officials. They, you know, they go and see the same people. But we have to, the EU has to broaden it, get deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and I think this is very important and just not for um, e uh, the, the East, but also for our Southern region as well. We have a lot of questions here. Uh, I don't know if Bidzina is going to guide me along these questions. Um, oh, yes. Uh, well, there's an awful lot about German leadership. I think we should plunge straight into German leadership, frankly. Um, you know, is it is it providing, it has this ambiguous relationship towards the Western Balkans as Merkel started this, what would you call it, Toby, a kind of dialogue. And then, I don't know, it's more trade rather than she did criticize the corruption, didn't really go anywhere. But can we just, um, given that Germany is just so important, uh, historically, politically, economically, socially, its role in Europe, uh, uh, a couple of points from the three of you, is Germany actually serious about pushing the European Union in a direction that will integrate, we're not talking about a larger, that will slowly integrate uh, its Eastern neighbors into Europe. Toby. That's a very good question. And I'm not sure I, I can necessarily answer it. What I, what I can say is that, I mean, okay, first of all, this is clearly still a government that's finding its footing. Uh, you, you talk, you know, you talk to the green uh, sort of political layer at the House and, um, and you talk to the Kanzleramt and you get two completely different um, uh, messages. 
not not just with regards to the Western Balkans, but but on on, on core issues really uh, of the EU's relationship with its neighbours, with sorry of Germany's relationship with its neighbours and with the EU. What what I do feel is um, perhaps atmospherically a greater openness to the idea of treaty change, to the idea of philosophically and atmospherically a greater openness to debate um, mm -hmm. than, than was evident before. But to what extent that actually then shapes policy is very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. to, um, we've just gone through this agonizing process of the conference on the future of Europe. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I, I mean, first of all, as a, as a, as a third country national, I, I always get annoyed by this use of Europe to mean the EU, but okay, that's a detail. Um, where, 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 you know, it was basically a roadshow where we yeah. asked all these citizens about what they wanted, and then you whittle that down into proposition, into proposals and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And, and frankly, I would be astonished if anything came of it. Mm. Now, maybe I'm just too cynical. I've been living in Brussels for 15 years. Uh, maybe mm. that's the toll this is taking. <laughs> um, I lived in the Balkans for, uh, for seven, eight years before that. So yeah. may maybe I should just get out of here. But, but <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tired of these attempts to reform that just okay. don't lead anywhere. And just a very quick point, if I may, about yeah, this uh, deepening versus enlarging, uh, enlarging question. I mean, I absolutely agree that you, you may have guessed that I agree that the EU ought to reform, but we've had ample chance to do so. I yeah. mean, the, la the Big Bang enlargement is now almost 20 years ago, and that time has just been wasted, frankly, in, yeah. in, in, in discussions that didn't really lead anywhere. So, mm -hmm. so let, let's take this moment and, and push for it. Mm -hmm. um, Toby, this is a really interesting point. Um, um, Tanya and Natalia, would you mind if I actually uh, threw in a question here? It's actually quite important and we didn't raise it because it's also in the context of Moldova, it's in the context of Ukraine and Russia. It's from uh, Irakli Serbiladza. The term de-oligarization de got picked up a lot in Georgia since the Commission's opinion listed it as one of the priorities to be addressed. How would you conceptualize the term vis-a-vis -vis Georgia? Uh, Natalie, can I throw this to you? And Tanya, you can give the institutional perspective. Natalie, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there were two, uh, two conditions that have been most discussed in Georgia. One is obviously de-oligarchization, another is uh, depolarization. Uh, both important issues, the oligarchization, as far as I know, also present in uh, the case of Ukraine uh, and Moldova. Mm -hmm. um, I have a problem, to be honest, with this kind of formulation, because I believe it's an abstract conditionality. It's, it's too much open to interpretation. The way I see it, if all the other points are implemented, mm. there are 12 in case of Georgia, yeah. Yeah. If you implement 11, you will get to both depolarization and probably the oligarchization as well. So it's, it cannot be part of the, of, I, I, I thought it was a mistake, to be honest, to put it as part of the 12, because it just invited, uh, 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 invited interpretation, it invited uh, the government to create a process that will not deliver on results. They will sit there and discuss who is oligarch, how can it be defined, or who is uh, you know, what does it mean to be depolarized? Well, in fact, it's, it's easy, but it's, it's just invitation to create a facade, a show, rather than deal with it meaningfully. So it has to be better defined. I don't think there is uh, uh, there is a wish now in the commission to come up with a breakdown of what it actually means, because obviously they can't. They can't come in and say, this is an oligarch and this isn't, and this mm -hmm. is what it means and this is what it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It is much better to concentrate on concrete deliverables when it comes to the judiciary, when it comes to power sharing, when it comes to strengthening of institutions, and there you have the oligarchization, where it's not about... yeah. It's interesting you say this. Am I on mute? No. And um, it's interesting, but reform is against the interests of the oligarchs. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, we have to well, keep this in mind. And, 
Yeah. And that's why I think that's why I think that these people, the, the current government will not implement the rest because it is against the regime, the kind of hybrid regime, illiberal hybrid yeah. regime that has been created in Georgia. Yeah. That means destroying it by their yeah. own hands. Well, it's very that's interesting. Why I think they won't do it. There's a so, hybrid regime now in, in Hungary, frankly, well, when you think of I the said, oligarchs around we're Orban. We're um, experiencing the same model. Um, Tanya, we have a question here which sort of touches, it depends on how you, how you link the questions, uh, the, the mental map. Um, and the mental map of, uh, here's the question. How dominant is the issue of the mental map of the EU establishment with regard to Georgia? To what extent do they consider Georgia as an in integral part of Europe? I mean, these are big questions for well, Europe. Well, and I can be specific. So, so three quick points, starting with the last question. I think it was a very clever move of Georgia to this distance itself from the southern Caucasus and make itself part of the trio countries that moved Georgia so much closer to Europe and I just leave it there I think that was a very very clever move people have understood even Georgia not having the kind of status yet they see it as part of Ukraine and Moldova those countries that need to be supported to escape that need to have a European perspective to escape the sphere of influence of Russia. So I think um, that has mm. been a game changer. The second point I wanted to make, yes, the oligarchs are a problem, but you won't get rid of them. You know, I mean, so you just have to live with them and work around them and maybe even work with them. I don't quite agree that they are in principle against any kind of reforms. You have to create incentives, both positive and negative. And the economic incentive, market integration is always good. I mean, there's yeah. great work on Ukraine and how Ukrainian oligarchs have actually been supportive of the implementation of the association agreement because it gives them access to the single market. So... It's a little bit more complicated. And the first point on German, German leadership, very briefly, I mean, what can I say about Chancellor Scholz? Let me put this in a polite way. I think he is still in the tradition of Germany being a champion of Eastern European countries, right? Against France, right? France is very much Southern oriented. Germany has always been Eastern. Here go. He is also very concerned about the unity of the European Union. What he hasn't still fully understood is that German leadership could be crucial in providing this unity and getting countries together. And I just don't see that happening. He lost so much credibility with Eastern Europe for his reluctant you know, insistence on, 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 on Nord Stream 2 and his reluctance with regard to weapon delivery. So, I mean... I really believe this is a problem. Merkel wasn't sort of the visionary leader, but she worked behind the scenes to unite the member states behind certain decisions she thought that were necessary to move forward. And I just don't see that quality with our current chancellor. And the chancellery is a particular problem. Yeah. C can we deal briefly as a kind of, um, not possible, but could we try to deal briefly with the German problem. Um, I, I think Schulz's role is actually undermining Europe in many ways uh, because we don't know what he stands for. It's so inconsistent. He says one thing publicly and then to the Bundestag or these interviews and you should see his CBS interview is so coherent. You think, wow, I mean, this is really something. But and then stops deliveries and hampers Poland, hampers Estonia. And I want to get to something quite um, important here about Germany. Is Germany's view of Georgia and of Ukraine, of Russia, in 2022 still conditioned on how it sees the Second World War and Ostpolitik? All do, none of you rushed to answer. Well, I can start if you want. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention um, Germany. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I can see from the experience that I've had in Brussels that Germany has a Russia problem and Germany deals with neighbors such as us 
still through Russia prism. Absolutely. And, and it's, a, it's a big handicap. Uh, they cannot come up with an independent policy towards us. Uh, and Russia is one animal and us are different and we're going in different directions and these require different responses. Uh, up until now, that has been consistently the case. I've seen German officials at various levels say this, you know, it's a line. Um, with Ukraine, with the kind of change in the German policy, uh, the, the, the proclaimed changes, there, were, there was hope that Germany will assume uh, a different role towards Eastern Europe and also towards within the EU, but they're not delivering because I think that fundamental Russia problem is still there and it has not been rethought at the policy level. So we experience this and the EU experiences it. Uh, and I also think that Germany needs to take a, a, a leading role uh, with it to reform uh, the EU as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, you asked at some point, uh, is the EU, is somebody doing it in the EU? Well, we don't know exactly who should be doing it. There is no like reform uh, DG, right? Mm -hmm. It should be ah, good point. from, the, uh, from the leading member states. And, uh, you know, Macron comes up with some ideas. Germany normally sabotages it. Germany is the status quo power without a vision at the moment for the EU. Um, one point on this, Natalie, um, on Macron, Germany actually never applied to any of Macron's proposals. So it, it does prefer the, the sleeping, the status quo, but the status quo is outliving its usefulness. Tanya, can you jump in here and then I'll take it on to Toby. I actually will remind you that, that, that Merkel was already criticized for not responding to Macron's family so bond speech. But honestly, I thought that was a somewhat cheap shot because Macron must have known that what he was proposing was simply not in line with the German government's position. And it's and I it has a certain vision of Europe, which is decisively different than the vision mm. France has, irrespective of who is in power. So there will always be issues, you know. How, I don't want to go into that, but I mean, there is a reason why, Mar why, why Merkel and Scholz have not responded to Macron, because that would have generated conflict and make it open that the two have very different ideas in which direction to take Europe ever since Maastricht, right? This has haunted us. So that's why I think, you know, people who hope for the big reforms, it's not going to happen. We have to work with the institutions. And I want to quote Ursula von der Leyen here. She says, the problem is not that the EU doesn't have the instruments to act. It is the political willingness that is lacking. And that brings us back to the German government. German leadership, together with French leadership, look at what Macron and Scholz accomplished with regard to Ukraine and Moldova, right? The candidate status, without them, everybody else fell in line once the two declared their support for that. So Germany and France, if they work together, they can really move Europe forward. And I just don't see that uh, on Scholz's behalf. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not convinced of this vi visit by Draghi and Macron and Scholz to to um, to Kiev, and they brought in. I thought it was quite insulting and in, uh, patronised. They brought in President Johannes from Romania. Uh, great, but why not bring in President Duda? Frankly, I mean, we need we need a, a much a, a bigger um, um, unity in terms of this, and. You know, I, I just felt the whole thing was um, um, it, not a, they went. OK, um, Toby, I want I want to uh, go to you on, on this question as well. I mean, we're hovering around the, the question all the time about Germany and it's not going to happen under Schulz. It's a pity Robert Habich isn't chancellor, frankly. Um, I mean, the, 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 this minister has so much energy and we really don't need Nord Stream 2 if you read the papers today because the storage are 66, 8% full and there'll be 90% by November. And somehow Schulz is, the Canadians are given into Schulz to get the turbine for Nord Stream 1. I mean, what is going on here, feeding this war machine? So uh, giving your perspective, I know I've been here a long time in Germany, you've been a long time in Brussels and, and other places, but are you, do you think Germany will, will, will grasp this, um, what Natalie says, grasp the realization that they cannot 
it can no longer look at Eastern Europe through the prism of Russia? Well, I hope so. Um, I mean, what we're seeing now is materially happening what people have been saying for many, many, many years ought to happen, which is, you know, Germany weaning itself off of cheap uh, Russian gas and oil. That's happening. I mean, that's pretty yeah. big. Um, we're sort of not paying enough attention to it because everyone is focused on, is, is fixated on on spot prices uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of energy and everyone is, is, is worried about, you know, my, my utility bill doubled from last month mm -hmm. and we, we, we will see, the, I mean, people will hurt. There's no doubt about that. But the big picture also at the same time is, is that we're doing something that people have been saying we should be doing for 20 years. With, with, which is really getting out of this very of, uh, of this dependency uh, relationship. Now, poli politics politics has a you know will will Germany lead? No, not on not until it's forced to. And I I think I think it was Tanya who mentioned the uh, the so called migration crisis. Uh, you didn't use those words um, of 2015 16. You know, uh, Chancellor Merkel acted quite decisively when she saw no other choice, when she was forced to. And she went out there and she quite forcefully decided, defended her policy. And I give her credit for that. And I think it was the right thing to do. I suspect we might see something similar happening if, if, if the stars align, if the pressure becomes so big that we, 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 you know, there's just no other way. There's no way to maintain the status quo. Um, now, the interesting the interesting issue is that uh, you look at the Western Balkans and you think, well, if this isn't enough of a, of a, of a, you know, of a crisis to force your hands, then, then what would be? I mean, it, it appears that it does require an actual shooting war for people to wake up. Um, and I'm, I'm very sorry to see that because there's a number of people who've been warning for many years that you know, the trajectory is going in the wrong direction in the Balkans. And I think Ukraine just sort of is driving ho home the point that, uh, you know, kicking the can down the road, eventually you will have, you, you will have to confront it. There's no other way to do it eventually. But of course, in the meantime, a lot of people might suffer. Um, that, that would be my very, very, very brief answer. And I'm afraid I'm not very optimistic about it. German leadership, that is. We've, we only have a few more minutes left, and I'm just looking at some of the questions. Uh, how dominant is the issue of the mental... Oh, we've done the mental map. Uh, Macron, we've decided... Uh, oh, <laughs> this is rather interesting. Uh, once you get in, you're in forever. Well, Ma Ma Hungary has not been kicked out, not even suspended. Well, I mean, we may, may as well... Well, we know we can't, but you would just wonder, once you're in... Can you exploit all the, the loopholes and, you know, get away with it? I and mean, it seems that if the, if the European Union wants to, have a, wants to get bigger and stronger and globally, it has to get its own house in order first in terms of what it stands for, its basic principles of, of, of values and freedom of the media and transparency and independent, uh, the rule of law. And it's not there at the moment. This is exactly what's happening in Georgia now. Uh, Natalie. Uh, I, I agree absolutely. I think uh, Hungary is a big uh, problem for the EU's moral power. Uh, and it's something that authorities in Georgia could exploit and say, well, this is Europe too. Uh, and, uh, you know, what has been done, uh, there's a fair question, uh, not suspended. I think when we talk about the reform of the EU, it's also important to consider that you might become 35, 36 in the future, very uneven uh, countries, and maybe they should consider as part of the, e of the reform mm -hmm. uh, an option of suspension, have a process ready so that it's there. You know, like with the enlargement, they've introduced this idea of reopening chapters. Uh, you close it once, but if you go back, just because you ticked the box yesterday doesn't mean that you, it cannot be unticked today. So some, that sort of approach might be useful to have it. So yeah. that's one thing that I think would help. And another yeah. thing that would help also, and we haven't 
touched about it because, okay, there's been a Brexit, but I think it's very important that we start thinking about UK-EU relations beyond Brexit and the cooperation and the kind of impact it can have also on the European policies in general and the transformation and the security and so on. I think this is something that also needs to be considered as part of the uh, of, of the overall approach. So mm -hmm. you have a divorce procedures now, more or less tested with the UK. I think you should be thinking about possible suspension procedures, particularly if you want, if it wants to grow, because mm -hmm. that would be that would be a leverage to to keep uh, keep the house in order to a degree. Well, this is this is uh, uh, this is quite important. This leverage issue, uh, which I go to Tanya on this, because if we talk about leverage for Georgia, I mean. Frankly, the leverage we have over Hungary and Poland and some other countries is the huge uh, COVID recovery plan. Uh, Tanya, are we being um, sort of uh, weak on this, or are we going to take this seriously? Or the the the, uh, the how the member states actually just exploit what we have? Well, you know, I think the EU does have a lot of leverage in, in, in different respects. The question is though, is what do we use this leverage for? And that brings you back to the whole Hungary. You can ask what 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 went wrong here? What what did the EU do wrong? And I think the EU, the research of the two, EU did everything right in the pre-accession period, right? So I just want to emphasize it because the EU has done everything wrong with regard to Romania and Bulgaria and then also the Western Balkans in the pre-accession period. So the EU used different accession strategies with regard to Hungary, so the first generation of Eastern enlargement, and then changed change strategy, uh, used it on or, or didn't adapt enough for Romania and Bulgaria, which were very different starting points, and now has replicated these strategies with the Western Balkans. And if the EU is simply transferring these strategies mm -hmm. to Ukraine and Georgia, it's going to be a disaster, yeah. right? So yeah. the EU needs to return to the to the strategy used on Hungary, Poland, and the first generation, focusing on building developmental capacities for inclusive growth. We talk a lot about the political criteria uh, Georgia has to fulfill, but Georgia also have suit issues with so with regard to social inequality and that and if yeah. the EU is reinforcing that by simply applying its one-size-fits-all approach it's gonna be a yeah. disaster so that's what I'm yeah. saying for Hungary last sentence Judy for Hungary what we did wrong was in the post-accession period the EU believed once you sort of democratize there is no way back yeah well I mean we may point at Hungary but look at what's happening in the U.S. Right. I mean, it's not that democratization yes. processes are irreversible. I leave it there. No, this is um, <sighs> this is another um, webinar. Um, what happens in the dysfunctional aspect of U.S. politics actually affects Europe. There's no doubt about it, especially the Roe versus Wade, political correctness, Supreme Court on energy how it fuels the, the encouragement of the populace here in Europe. They can only benefit from what's happening in, in, in the United States. It's very worrying. Uh, Toby, I'll, I'll give you the, the last word on this, um, uh, how, I, how I framed the question uh, about, about Europe. Um, I mean, we're not in the best shape, but I don't want to be so pessimistic either, but uh, we just can't continue with the status quo. Well, we will try to and we will be able to continue with the status quo up, up to the moment when we can't. I mean, I, you know, I, it, it's not black and white, I don't think. But w one aspect that maybe hasn't really been discussed very much uh, today so far is um, I look at the Western Balkans, I look at Georgia. Um, you know, you have these 12, uh, I forgot how it's phrased, it's not conditions, is it? But, you know, these priority mm -hmm. areas or whatever, however, whatever the, the wording is. Uh, Bosnia got, and they're, I mean, I, I think they're quite good. They're, they're quite blunt. And I think bluntness is good. Um, Bosnia got something very similar from the co commission uh, about three years, precisely three years ago, actually, 14 points. And of those 14s, uh, 14 points. I haven't really kept close track, but I think one, maybe one and a half have been met. Um, what I would say about that is I think, I think 
citizens in these countries, in the country, citizens, citizens who want their countries to join the European Union should also understand that they should try to use this process to use these conditions um, for, to their advantage, to the advantage of their country. So be less focused on, oh, are we going to be a candidate status? Are we going to mm -hmm. get candidate status? Are we okay. going to open chapters and so on? Mm -hmm. And more focused on what this would do to your country. Yeah. And I, I still think on balance that joining the European Union is, is probably for most countries that I can think of a good thing, you know, un unless you're Norway or Switzerland or whatever, maybe, maybe in those cases it isn't. But, but also, frankly, even in those cases, just as a footnote, you see a great deal of alignment uh, on, on regulation, but also on values. Yeah. So, so let's, let's try to turn this into something that works for Georgia. I think this, well, you, you, you've hit on, on an issue that we brought up very, very early on. These, the civil society, the activists, the NGOs, independent media, young people, they try. Oh, yeah. They try in the Western Balkans, in Georgia, let's leave out Ukraine, in Moldova. They try as much as they can. And somehow I think that the focus um, by, this is why I mentioned the status quo, that the European Union must get out of the, the, the status quo mentality and be much more inclusive and broad on how yes. it deals with these yes. reforms. No. Because, um, and one other thing, and Toby, you know, and all of you know this, the huge uh, exodus of young people yes. from these countries. It's sure. debilitating. Yes. And it plays Just... into the hands of the status quo and the oligarchs. And as my colleague in Carnegie Europe, uh, Dimitra Beshev wrote, um, people like Vucev, they... they um, they, they know how to play the, the EU language, but back home, you know, they just distorted. But um, I think in terms of, it's not even imagination, in terms of using the, the diaspora, trying to create a, a, an Erasmus programme in reverse, that we can get the talented diaspora back and push this civil society, push this democracy on the grassroots. I think this would be enormous help for Georgia, uh, for the region and for the Western Balkans. And um, this is this requires a new mindset, a new imagination, because we have to get out of the uh, kind of old fashioned process of status quo. And that's why what Efu and Yena and Georgia do, you bring in young people, but they have to go home. They have to go home. And I'm Irish. I didn't go home, <laughs> but a lot of us do go home. But um, and we try to influence in, in some way or other. Any case, I think we've, um, unless there's any more questions or comments, I, I don't see any. Let me have a look here. Um, the term we've done that. Uh, I think. I think. Any any other comments to make? I think that wraps it up. Judy, there is one thing I wanted to point out, which I find really remarkable, is that in all the debate about who qualifies for Canada status and who doesn't, the issue of the unresolved territorial conflicts have not been brought yeah. up. And I think that is a, it is huge, right? I mean, I, of course, it has to do with Ukraine and the war in Ukraine. I understand that. But still, that could be set up, you know, a precedent. Because so far, the EU has always said countries who have unresolved territorial issues mm. must not get a perspective. And here you go. You have Ukraine and, and Moldova. yeah. And so the whole issue about Abkhazia and South Ossetia is not an issue that has been put on the priority list of the commission. I find that just remarkable. I just wanted to flag the issue. I think this is very important to flag it because we're hypocritical on it, because Cyprus joined the EU in 2004. They were, there was the commission clinking the glasses and we're going to get the unification of Cyprus. And now, you know, you can always use an excuse, territorial integrity, or they can't have it. Well, I mean, NATO can use this and the EU, we can always find excuses, but we can always actually um, do much more to support the territorial integrity of our countries. Just think of what happened to Europe before 1945 and after 1945. And in this way, the usage of history is very, very important for borders, for stability, for identity and for culture. And um, I think this is something that uh, we cannot abuse when it comes to how Russia is using the card 
of undermining territorial integrity to prevent these countries from either joining NATO or the EU. This is a very nasty card, apart from its energy um, card it's playing as well. Thanks, Tanya, for bringing this up. I just, if I can add uh, very briefly, Russia has also been very successful before now, presenting each and every conflict as a separate one. And I remember very much in Brussels lobbying too hard, but not really getting anywhere to say that, look, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, they have their own causes, consequences, impact, etc. but they're part of the same policy, precisely the policy that you mentioned, Judy. And this response has to be common too. What Russia managed to do is to have, oh no, Abkhazia is a totally different reality. Crimea is different, Donetsk Lugansk is different, Transnistria. And that has diluted the, the strength of the response as well. Natalie, you're getting into something terribly fundamental uh, about the European Union that it lacks a strategic outlook and yes we can have um, there's no one size for all of these countries but this is about having a strategic outlook not a vision a, a strategy that is not short term that is not sus susceptible to change of governments that is not susceptible of the makeup of the european parliament we need a long term strategy and i would recommend all of you to read this extraordinary essay in this week's economist on what happened to hong kong this didn't happen overnight it was it's an extraordinary piece of writing calculated cold um, up step by step. Um, Russia's strategy is, is a bit more chaotic, but nevertheless, there's a strategy. In it. And uh, I, I don't want to mention this person. I was sitting in the Enlargement Commission, Commissioner's office in 2011. And that's when Russia started imposing a chocolate ban on Ukraine embargo and intimidating Crimea. And I said to the commissioner, I said, do you know what's happening in Ukraine at the moment? And this is only the beginning. Mm, I don't know. I said, what, please, this is only the beginning. And the strategy was in place probably at the Munich Security Conference back in 2008. We don't think strategically. And Germany, doesn't want to think strategically because of its economic interests and i can't you cannot blame you cannot keep blaming history for not thinking strategically anyway i shall leave it at that um i think it's time to thank our great great panelists uh natalie sabernadze uh tanya it great to see you again tanya and toby fogel you 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 have great colleagues that contribute to strategic europe and our great organizers Bitnitze, Lebanitze, and Renate Skardutia. I think there's a bit of a Lithuanian uh, Baltic uh, name up there. Karaditsla. Oh, God, I mean, a Lithuanian uh, Baltic and, and <laughs> Georgian thing. And our other organizers, all the people who sent all these lovely chat messages and keep us going. It was really very important to discuss this. And um, I wish you all a restful summer. And, uh, and good luck to Ukraine as well, and to Georgia, of course. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank